As we enter into the 24th chapter of Matthew, 13th chapter of John, we are definitely into the last week of Jesus before leading up to the crucifixion. There is overlap in these, and, uh, and perhaps the lessons could have been uh, constructed, organized better, but um, we'll try to follow a logical order in this one, even though it'll pick up some of what we covered in the last lesson. In chapter 12, Jesus returns to Bethany. Very significantly, John chapter 12 opens telling us six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. This is Jesus' final Passover. Jesus will be crucified at Passover. We are into the last week. And Jesus has gone back to the very location where his fame spread to the extent the Jewish leaders wanted to kill him. And so in a way he is setting the stage for his coming death. He goes back to Bethany to have dinner with Mary and Martha and Lazarus who has been raised from the dead. At that time, Mary anoints Jesus with some expensive ointment. Verse uh, 3 tells us, Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. We're told elsewhere in the Gospels that she broke an alabaster vial. The word is really alabastron, which was the name of a certain kind of container, two pictures of which you see uh, on the slide. The bottom one seems to be made of alabaster. That one is an ancient Egyptian alabastron. The top one is from around the time of the Gospel, and it is a glass alabastron, and I would guess that she broke it, it's more likely, that kind of alabastron that she poured the ointment out from. Judas Iscariot becomes more prominent now. He says, how dare she do that? She should have sold it for the poor. He said that was worth, and the figure he uses is a year's wages. But John, the writer, explains to us he wasn't really concerned about the poor. He was a thief. He'd been helping himself to the money that they had for the support of their ministry. But Jesus praises Mary. Verse 7. Leave her alone, so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. Jesus dismisses his objection about the poor, and even if it were true, he says Mary is the one who has grasped the significance that he'll soon be buried. He's facing increasing opposition from Jerusalem. Crowds have come to see Lazarus and Jesus together. But the chief priests want to kill Lazarus because so many people are leaving them and believing in Jesus because of Lazarus. First of all, let's get a framework for what's going on in the last week leading up to the crucifixion. On a Sunday of that week, Jesus made his triumphant entry into Jerusalem, the crowds cheering. On Tuesday, he is giving admonitions um, to those who oppose him, uh, warnings to his own disciples, and perhaps on Tuesday, some would say on Wednesday, Judas leaves to betray Jesus, begins bargaining with the Jewish leaders. 
Many scholars say that we don't have any record of what happened on Wednesday. Perhaps he was in Bethany with his friends for a quiet day. It seems to be on Thursday that he celebrated his last supper. And then, of course, on Friday is the crucifixion. Saturday is nothing but the tomb. And then Sunday is the resurrection. We're told the next day, we're getting into that final week, that Jesus enters Jerusalem in triumph. Uh, we'll skip back to um, the Matthew account of this. Matthew chapter 21. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples and told them to go get a donkey and told them where they could get it and that uh, it would be provided. Verse 6, they did as Jesus directed them, brought the donkey and the colt, and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. And most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. The way Jesus arrives is full of meaning. He comes in on a donkey, as the Messiah was prophesied to do in Zechariah. It's significant that when there was a challenge to King David's throne among his sons, that Solomon was pointed out to be the true heir, and in the ceremony where that was pointed out, he arrived on a donkey. Not a war horse, but humbly on a donkey. So Jesus is coming humbly on a donkey, and yet he is coming prominently. Most people would be walking, as you can see in that picture from some reenactment. Jesus is uh, considerably higher to, to your line of sight than the other people around him. So the crowds cheer as he gets near the city, and they make the road smoother with their clothes, with palm branches, and when they shout out Hosanna, they're saying, save us, or salvation, they're recognizing him as the Savior. And they declare, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're giving the expressions of a psalm, Psalm 118, that tells about the Messiah. And now the whole city is talking about who this is. Jesus comes in triumph, and he comes in righteous indignation. He repeats an act that John tells us he had performed early on in his ministry. Jesus now, according to Matthew 21, has arrived in Jerusalem, and he's gone to the temple, and he entered the temple. Verse 12 he drove out all who sold and bought in the temple, and he overturned the tables of the money changers, the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, that you make it a den of robbers. So Jesus has his second cleansing of the temple. People come for healing. The children are cheering Jesus, Hosanna in the highest, to the son of David. Well, the priests are indignant. They want Jesus to stop them from saying such a thing. And then Jesus quotes the eighth psalm. 
out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies, you've prepared praise. At the end of the day, Jesus goes back to Bethany to spend the night. And when he comes back, he's hungry the next day and sees a figless fig tree and curses it. He says, it'll never bear fruit, and it withers up. The disciples are a little confused at his action, and they marvel. Verse 20 says, uh, they ask, how the fig tree wither all at once? And Jesus says, really, I tell you, if you have faith and don't doubt, you'll not only do what's been done to the fig tree, but if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it'll happen. Whatever you ask in prayer, you'll receive if you have faith. Mountain moving faith. Jesus comes in triumph and he comes in righteous indignation. He repeats an act that John tells us he had performed early on in his ministry. Jesus now, according to Matthew 21, has arrived in Jerusalem and he's gone to the temple and he entered the temple. Verse 12, he drove out all who sold and bought in the temple and he overturned the tables of the money changers, the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. You make it a den of robbers. So Jesus has his second cleansing of the temple. People come for healing. The children are cheering Jesus, Hosanna in the highest, to the son of David. Well, the priests are indignant. They want Jesus to stop them from saying such a thing. And then Jesus quotes the eighth psalm. Out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies, you've prepared praise. At the end of the day, Jesus goes back to Bethany to spend the night. And when he comes back, he's hungry the next day and sees a figless fig tree and curses it. He says, it'll never bear fruit and it withers up. The disciples are a little confused at his action, and they marvel. Verse 20 says, uh, they ask, how the fig tree wither all at once? And Jesus says, really, I tell you, if you have faith and don't doubt, you'll not only do what's been done to the fig tree, but if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it'll happen. Whatever you ask in prayer, you'll receive if you have faith. Mountain moving faith. Now, beginning in Matthew 24, we're at about Tuesday, where Jesus is giving many warnings and admonitions as he comes for the last time to Jerusalem. Jesus now faces all kinds of challenges to his authority. Coming back this day into the temple, verse 23 says, When he entered the temple, the chief priest and the elders of the people came up to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority? Jesus said, Well, let me ask you a question. If you answer, I'll tell you about my authority. Where did the baptism of John come from? Heaven or, or people? So they say, well, if we say it's from heaven, he'll say, why didn't you believe him? If we say it's from people, then, well, boy, the crowd thinks, of John, thinks John's a prophet. And they say, we don't know. And Jesus said, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. And so Jesus doesn't want to enter into this repeated discussion of his authority again. He has 
boldly proclaimed his authority as coming from God. And he's not going to get into that quarrel with him at this time. So he goes on to try to reach some with a parable or explain to believers in a parable what's going on. He tells about two sons. He goes to the first son, this is chapter uh, 21, verse 28, and he tells his son, go work in the vineyard today. But the son says, no, but he does change his mind and, and goes. Well, he goes to the other son and says the same thing, and he says, okay, I'll go. But he doesn't go. The question Jesus poses is, which of the two did the will of his father? Well, even his opponents understand that story. Well, the first one. Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, tax collectors and prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. John came to you in the way of righteousness and you didn't believe him. Tax collectors and prostitutes believed him. And even when you saw it, you afterward didn't change your mind and believe it. So he says, they're refusing to repent. And they have ever since the time of John the Baptist. He tells another story, and it is full of allusions to what's about to happen to Jesus. Here another parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard with a fence around it, like wine press in, and built a tower and leased it to tenants. And he went to another country. When the season for fruit grew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another, stoned another. Then he sent other servants, more than the first, and did the same thing to them. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Let's kill him and have his inheritance. They took him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. When therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He'll put those wretches to a miserable death. Let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their season. Can you see how clearly it is about Jesus? People that God has blessed with his revealed will, who have mistreated prophets, and now will mistreat the Son. The people who hear the story understand that in the story, that deserves severe punishment. But they're not getting the connection to Jesus, or they refuse to see it. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you, that is to you Jewish leaders, and given to a people producing its fruits. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived he was speaking about them. And although they were uh, seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowd, because they held him to be a prophet. This message about the stone comes from another uh, Old Testament passage. He started by saying to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. He's trying to get them to understand that they're rejecting the one that God has sent. But even though they know he's talking about them, they're not going to change. They'd like to arrest Jesus, but the crowds consider him a prophet, so they can't do that yet. In the 22nd chapter, we're going to 
skip over another important story, similar to the one we just read. We're going to see how different groups are trying to make Jesus look bad by asking him questions. Then in verse 15, the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle him in his words. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Now we need to stop and notice who these groups are. The Pharisees are devoted to keeping Jewish people Jewish. Herodians, those who would align themselves with King Herod, would seem to be those who are ready to assimilate into Roman, uh, Roman society and Greek Western ways. And they would have been at odds with each other, but these, this is an unholy alliance of groups that religiously are far apart. One, supporting the Roman occupation. Another, resisting the ways of the Romans, not so much the government, but the Roman uh, culture. So this is who goes, Herodians and representatives of the Pharisees. The question, teacher, we know you're true. Teach the way of God truthfully. Notice it says they're trying to entangle him in his words. You don't care about anybody's opinion. You're not swayed by appearances. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Well, you have to stop and, and think. I guess in today's current events, perhaps it would be whether um, if whether the people in, in Crimea should pay their taxes to the Russians or the Ukrainians. Uh, that would be a, a very tough question, depending on which side you, you stood on. We want Jesus to offend one group or the other by saying whether he supports supporting the Romans or not. But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, I put me to the test, you hypocrites. Show me the coin for the tax. They brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. With a wise reply. Government exists. Cooperate with the government. What's more important is give God what's due to him. It says they marveled at what he said. They left him. They went away. Now the Sadducees, another religious group, uh, comes up. They are Jews who uh, don't believe there is a resurrection. It says it was the same day, verse 23, the same day Sadducees came to him who say there is no resurrection, and they asked him a question. Teacher, Moses said, a man dies, having no children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. And there are seven brothers among them. First married and died, having no offspring, left his wife to his brother, and so to the second, third, down to the seventh. After them all, the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, of the seven, whose wife will she be? They all had her. So they think they have this hypothetical that will prove their point. There couldn't be a resurrection. That just wouldn't work. Well, Jesus explains why they are wrong. Verse 29 is significant. You are wrong because you know neither the Scriptures nor the power of God. From the resurrection, they neither marry or are given in marriage but are like angels in heaven. As for the resurrection of the dead, haven't you read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but of the living. And when the crowd heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. So Jesus affirmed that resurrection is true. He also is 
harking back to things that he said that he knows are in heaven. He knows how people are, that they're similar to angels in the fact that there's no marriage. He knows that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob are alive in heaven. And that the scriptures reflect that. So he silenced the people who are trying to trick him. And then the people ask questions, and Jesus is actually answering the real question. Verse 34. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. In other words, they're impressed. Their rivals have been put in their place. One of the Pharisees, a lawyer, asked him a question. Teacher, what is the great commandment in the law? Now, I can just break away a minute here and, and, and try to grab your attention. Someone just asked Jesus Christ, what is the great commandment? I think we should know the answer. And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments, depend all the law and the prophets. He's not giving them a new answer. He's giving them answers from the Hebrew Scriptures, from the Old Testament. And all Jews would have regularly have recited the Shema, which says, The Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. They also would have been quite aware that the law requires that you be loving towards your neighbors. And Jesus says that just sums up the whole of the Hebrew Scriptures. This is the law and the prophets. Then the Pharisees ask the pertinent, important question. What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? Son of David. He said to them, How then is it that David in the Spirit calls him Lord? And then he quotes from one of David's Psalms. The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. That is, the Lord God in heaven spoke to the Lord King David. If David calls him Lord, that is, David King, speaks to someone else. How is he his son? In other words, what is this thing about being son of David and, uh, and God's king? No one was able to answer him a word, not from that day, nor from that day did anyone dare ask him any more questions. So, would David call the Christ, they understand this to be a Christ-centered psalm, Lord, and so he's telling them there, there's more there in the scripture than you understood. Well, he comes back against the Pharisees in chapter 23. He's warning the crowds and the disciples not to follow them. The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do. So they preach but do not practice. The phrase that he uses is about sitting on Moses' seat. Surely refers to they want the prominent positions when people gather for worship in the synagogue. The picture in the upper right in the slide is an ancient stone seat that comes from an ancient uh, synagogue in Chorazin, uh, perhaps from around the year 300. And it's been popularly called the Seat of Moses, and you can see it has some Hebrew writing on it, and it would have been where you sat uh, in a prominent place in the synagogue. The uh, grayscale picture you see at the bottom right is uh, <clears throat> one of the oldest uh, synagogues in, in the 
Western Hemisphere that well in, in the Americas, uh, the Toro Synagogue in Newport, Rhode Island. And you can see the, uh, the Bema, the, uh, the raised area where someone would read from the Torah, and that there are uh, seats for prominent people up around it, and then the congregation would sit beyond there. He says, these people love the prominent seat of Moses. And Jesus says, to the extent they tell you God's word, do it. But listen, they don't do it. Don't behave like they do. He says in verse 4, they tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear. Lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves aren't willing to move them with a finger. But first of all, he says, they make high demands on other people, but they're not willing to do anything about those demands. And he says, in effect, they do everything to be seen. They wear broad phylacteries and long tassels. There are at the bottom of the screen pictures of some ancient phylacteries that were found in Qumran. Uh, these little... Uh, leather pouches folded up into about a one inch square and would have had a, a scripture in them and people wore them. You can see in the modern picture that uh, the boy is carrying a, a Torah scroll but if you look on their arms you see that there are phylacteries wound around their arms and they're even wearing uh, little boxes with scripture on their head. This is taking literally the admonition of the Hebrew scriptures to bind it before your eyes and, and um, you also see they have tassels on their uh, on their garments that also is to remind them of who they were as Jewish people. Well, Jesus says that the Pharisees of his day would wear broad phylacteries, long tassels, and when they go to the dinners and when they're at the synagogue, they all want the prominence. They like people to call them Rabbi, but he says, don't give titles to people. People are all on the same level, family, brothers. There's only one person ought to be given the title teacher, and that's Christ. There's only one person who, be, who should be referred to with the title being Father, and that's God. And Jesus says, among his people... The greatest one is going to be the servant, not the one who is seeking honor for himself. Then he pronounces woes on the scribes and Pharisees. Woe, sadness, uh, something terrible is going to happen to you. Here are some things that he says are wrong with them. You shut the kingdom in people's faces, but you refuse to enter yourself. That is, you have a lot of religious rules, and you say there are a lot of people that God's going to reject because they don't live up to your rules. But when you hear what the true kingdom of God is, you're not willing to go in. So you'll, you'll make great efforts to go proselytize, that is, go make a convert. You cross the world for that, and you end up making them children of hell. Oh, you can make all kinds of loopholes. So if you swear by this or that, it's more important than this or that. And he says, oh, and, and, and oh, yeah, you, you tithe. You're really careful about how you count off a tenth that belongs to God. Verse 23 is very important. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You tithe mint and dill, and cumin, spices and herbs, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, and mercy, and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. That passage is so rich. In the middle of it, he says the problem is that they neglected 
the weightier matters of the law. That phrase in itself is a challenge to all who would follow Jesus. You need to study to know what are the weightier matters of God's law. And they are things like justice and mercy and faithfulness. Not whether you were that meticulous in deciding how much your spices were worth and what a tenth of that would be for you to give to God. Although he doesn't scold them for being meticulous, he says you should have done it without neglecting the important. Don't neglect the important matters and tend to the minor matters instead. Blind guy, crane out a net, swallowing a cat. He says, oh, you're all about being clean on the outside. You want to appear clean, but inside you're full of greed. Self-indulgence. He says it's, uh, it's like a cleaning up a food container on the outside, but the inside is nasty, like that picture at the bottom of the screen. He says it's like tombs. People build beautiful, beautiful tombs. Think about what's inside them. Pictures at the bottom. On the left is, is of course, the Taj Mahal. You know what the Taj Mahal is? It's a burial crypt. The middle one, I believe, is the um, crypt of Michelangelo. And I guess that would be appropriate for Michelangelo. It's beautiful. But when you think about what's in there, Bones of dead people. He says, that's what the scribes and Pharisees are like. Look real good on the outside, but the inside is hypocrisy and not submitting to God's law. And then he comes out and he says, you build monuments to the prophets, but you and your ancestors are the ones who killed them. That uh, third picture is said to be the tomb of Zechariah the prophet. Jesus is completely unhappy with the religious leaders of his day. Beginning in verse 32 of Matthew 23. Fill up then the measure of your fathers. He's just said it. your fathers have killed the prophet. You serpents. You brood of vipers. How are you going to escape being sentenced to hell? Therefore, I send you prophets, wise men, scribes, some of whom you'll kill, crucify, some you'll flog in your synagogues and persecute from town to town, so that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. In Matthew 24, Jesus has been in the temple, and he is about uh, to leave, and on the way out, his disciples comment on the huge construction project that uh, is the temple. And Jesus has startling news for them. Jesus left the temple, walking away, when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to the building. Do you see all these things? Yes. Truly I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. It is going to be cataclysmic. They, they, they can't imagine the temple being destroyed. It, it, it would be like in our day, the bombing of the Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor. It would be airplanes crashing into the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. It would be earth shattering to them. And so they feel like this must be the end of the world if this is about to happen. And so, the disciples respond by asking questions. Verse 3 of chapter 24 says, As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, 
tell us. When will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Now, my guess is that the disciples thought all of this was going to happen at the same time. But as Jesus responds, it becomes apparent that there are two different questions within their question, and so there are two different answers. The one question at the beginning, uh, when they come to him in verse 3, is when will these things be? That is, these things that Jesus says, all the stones that make up this temple will be thrown down. When will the temple be destroyed? And then they also ask, uh, when is the end of the age coming? What's going to be the sign of, of your coming? In other words, when will Jesus return? Jesus answers the first question down through about verse 35, and the second from about 36 through 44. And then after that, he's going to teach some important lessons about always being ready. Break it down now. When will the temple be destroyed? When will these things happen? Well, first of all, Jesus warns them not to be led astray. Verse 4. And in verse 5, he says, Many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ. And they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars, rumors of wars. See to it that you're not alarmed, for this must take place. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famine and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of the birth pain. And then he tells about persecutions that will come to Christians, and false prophets that are going to lead people away. And in verse 12, wickedness will be increasing. Verse 13, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And the gospel is going to be proclaimed. So, in about verses 4 down through 14, he says, don't think it's a sign of the end, even of, even of the destruction of the temple, just because there are false Christ claiming to be who they are not, or that a war has arisen, or some terrible natural disaster, or even that persecution has come. Now the gospel is going to be spread worldwide before these terrible things happen. But he does prophesy of a terrible day, and history tells us that that day came in the year 70, uh, some um, 40 years after the time of Christ. So picking up in verse 15, some complicated material. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains and tell how terrible it will be. So he's talking about a time when the temple, the holy precincts, will be desecrated. And again, he says there are going to be many people who are misled. It's going to be a terrible time. And again, he says there'll be false Christ, like I told you before, verses 24 and 25. Verse 26. So, if they say to you, look, he's in the wilderness, don't go out. If they say, look, he's in the inner room, don't believe it. All right, so the lightning comes from east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is, there 
so the vultures will gather. We don't have time to look at all of it, but when you look at uh, the parallel accounts in the other Gospels, you see that Jesus told them there would, there would be troops surrounding Jerusalem, that people would need to run away for their safety. And he says that this isn't the return of Jesus. Verse um, 27, very plainly, uh, it'd be like lightning all the way across the sky. You're not going to wonder if it's Jesus when Jesus comes back. He goes on about the terrible things to come. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather immediately after the tribulation of those days. Then he uses what we call apocalyptic language, a language in the style of the book of Revelation or the book of Daniel. The sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven. The powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they'll gather his elect. From the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Then he talks a little bit about seeing the signs. And then he says something uh, remarkable in the verses 34 and 35. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all the, these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Now obviously there is a a coming end and judgment that's described from about all oh, verses 29 through uh, 31. That's obviously the coming of the Son of Man, but that's not what he's talking about here. He says that's going to be after the tribulation, the time of troubles that they're facing in Jerusalem, and then this is this judgment is coming later. So, moving down then to verse uh, 34. There's a contrast in verse 36, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. So, he's moving then at about verse 36 to uh, the other question. So, Jesus returns to that Topic. Now we're dealing with the second part of the question, when will Jesus return? Well, in the verses we just read, uh, verses, uh, verse uh, 36 in particular, nobody knows that day. That is, Jesus himself doesn't know, only the Father in heaven knows, the angels don't know, Jesus doesn't know. But it's going to be sudden to those who aren't watching, to those who aren't expecting it. It's going to be like the days of Noah. The whole thing is you don't know when the Lord is coming. And so then Jesus teaches lessons from their question, and the lessons are always be ready. And he uses familiar parables. He tells a parable of some servants who were not prepared for their master to return. And uh, when he did return early, then... Uh, then they were punished because they were not prepared. And he says, uh, verse 48, The wicked servant says, My master is delayed and begins to beat his fellow servants, eat and drink to the drunkard. The master of that house uh, will come on a day when he doesn't expect him. They'll cut him in pieces, throw him in with hypocrites, and weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the very familiar story of the ten virgins, the ten bridesmaids. You remember the story. Uh, some were not ready when the wedding time came, and they were shut out. And then the very, very familiar passage of the parable of the talents. The uh, master was going away, and he had three servants, and he gave them each about as much money as they could handle. And uh, two of them did well, prospered while he was gone. But when he came back, there was one man who was just afraid. He was so blinded by his fear, he didn't do anything with his master's money. 
the master was going to punish him because he didn't prepare by doing something. He wasn't prepared for the master's return. And then Jesus tells us about judgment day, about the final judgment. So we pick up in chapter 25 now in verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, that's what they ask about. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations. And he'll separate people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he'll place the sheep on his right but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Then he'll turn to those on the left. Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Because you didn't do any of these things that the righteous did. And they'll say, oh, but Lord, we, we did. And he'll say, you didn't do it for the least of the brethren. You didn't do it for me. Again, the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 was cataclysmic for the Jews. There is a, on the slide in front of you, the first picture is from the Arch of Titus. Titus was the general who in AD 70 destroyed Jerusalem because Jews were rebelling against Rome. All three pictures on the left are the Arch of Titus, which still stands in Rome. Titus later became an emperor. But the most fascinating part to students of the Bible is that first picture on the screen. There is engraved there, from near the time when Titus was alive, a picture of the processional in Rome where they're showing the spoils of war from the time that Titus destroyed Jerusalem. The most interesting part of the picture is, is the one that has the most light on it the golden candlestick, the menorah, that was taken from the Jewish temple. So in front of that, you can see they're carrying various trumpets and standards. And this was the conquest of Jerusalem. You know how Jesus said that uh, the stones would all be thrown down? In fairly recent years, excavations have been done in, in a few places around the walls of the temple precinct. What you see on the upper right, is a first century road. As you can see, there's rubble piled up there. In the bottom uh, two pictures are closer up pictures of that rubble. Those are stones that were thrown down by the Romans when they destroyed the temple. Like so many parts of scripture, this prophecy of an act of God in history, this time the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, is used to teach a more important lesson about the ultimate intervention of God in history at the end of the world. Many scholars say that we don't have any record of what happened on Wednesday. Perhaps he was in Bethany with his friends for a quiet day. We pull together some from Luke along with some from Matthew. Jesus is getting prepared to leave this world, and he's preparing the disciples for his end. He says the Passover is two days away. Now, Passover was a week-long celebration, so we're guessing he's talking about the beginning of the Passover week, so something like that. 
And he again tells them, but now, certainly with more urgency, the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Knowing what we know about Jesus, knowing what he said back in the temptations that he could call for legions of angels, although he wouldn't do that, knowing that Jesus said nobody takes his life from him, but he lays it down of his own accord, we see that Jesus allows for his betrayal, betrayal to those who are going to kill him. We're told specifically in chapter 26, beginning in about verse 3, that the chief priests and elders of the people gathered in the palace of the high priest, his name was Caiaphas, and plotted together in order to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. They won't wait till after the feast. That we're going to kill. You now, uh, verses 6 through 13 tell of another story of another woman anointing Jesus. And again, uh, he talks about the beauty of, of her act and that uh, is preparing for his burial. And he says, Truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what, she's done, been, what she has done will also be told in memory of. Then we run into the sad, disturbing part that we cover partly in the last lesson. Judas betrays Jesus. We're told that Satan entered into Judas. And then he went to the religious leaders, the ones who were plotting against Jesus. Let's go to Luke chapter 22 briefly. Then Satan entered into Judas called Iscariot, who was of the number of the twelve. He went away and conferred with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them. They were glad agreed to give him money. So he consented and sought an opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of a crowd. Jesus goes on prepares the meal. You know he's going to get 30 silver coins. Jesus goes and arranges that meal. It's the time of Passover was combined with the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And it's time to prepare the lamb for the, for the um, sacramental meal. He sends Peter and John to get a uh, Room. I want you to look at these pictures. The first, of course, the uh, extremely well-known painting of the Last Supper, uh, which is a wonderful piece of art, but does not show how they would have been arranged at a table. At the bottom, you see not as artful a picture, but a, a more accurate picture of how dinners would have been held in that day and time. You see a three-sided table arrangement. It was called a triclinium. And people would stretch out on cushions, lean on an elbow perhaps, and uh, they didn't sit up at tables like we do. And that's why you hear of the one next to Jesus or leaning up close to Jesus. They were practically lying down while they were eating. So when you picture this Last Supper, picture something more like the bottom one instead of the well-known one. 
back to Matthew 26. Jesus reveals the sad things that are to come. He memorializes his sacrifice in what we call the Lord's Supper. He tells us that the bread represents his body. And so when he breaks the bread, he says, take, eat. This is my body. Then he serves the cup, which represents his blood. He says, all of you drink from this. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. Luke's account includes the line, do this in remembrance of me, which indeed we as Christians do regularly. And then he tells them that they're going to fall away later that night. They're going to scatter away like sheep that night. Peter says, no, I never will. And that's when Jesus says, truly I tell you, this very night, before the rooster crows, Go to nine three times. But all of them say, Oh no, Lord, I'd rather die than deny you. As we saw in our previous study, Jesus does identify his betrayer. One of you will betray me, and they agonize over who is it. But he tells Judas, You said it. And he says, Is it me? He said that he's going to give a piece of food to the betrayer, and he does it. He gives it to Judas. And we're told again that Satan enters Judas, and he says, what you're about to do, do it quickly. And then Judas goes out into the night.
John provides us such a beautiful story that gives us the context of this Last Supper. I know that it's very meaningful to some people to reenact the washing of feet as a uh, religious act. Uh, I don't see that uh, as prescribed as a church practice. It certainly could teach a wonderful lesson. I want us to look at it in its original context. Jesus is showing the greatest humility. Listen to how John 13 starts out. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. His heart is full. He knows the time has come. He knows he's leaving this world to go to the Father. He's leaving the ones that he loves. During supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garment and taking a towel, tied it around his waist, and he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He knows all the significance of this time, but he takes the lowest servant's role, puts away his holiday clothes, his banquet clothes, his towel around his waist for work, and he washes and dries the disciples' dirty feet. He has to explain it though. Peter, in Rob says, as usual, it's Peter. He has to teach Peter to learn to accept instruction. Peter says, what are you doing? And he says, now you're never going to wash my feet. And Jesus says, you'll understand later. If you don't let me do this, you're not one of mine. And then Peter overreacts. Uh, wash my whole body. He says, I'm just washing your feet. You're clean. And then as an aside, he says, you're not everyone else here. He's thinking about Jesus. Then he teaches us all to learn that humility. His lesson is, if your teacher and Lord washes your feet, you ought to wash feet. You ought to do the most menial task to serve people. And you are blessed when you humble yourself enough to imitate the mass. And then Jesus prepares the rest of the apostles for his departure. They don't want to hear it, but he tells them, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. We have children, yet a little while, I'm with you. You will seek me. And just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I'm going, you cannot come. He is first very softly referring to his departure as being glorified. But he says, I'm going, and you can't follow me. At this time, in verse 34, he tells them about what it's supposed to be like after he's gone. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you're my disciples, if you have love for one another. What a beautiful legacy he leaves. 
that the followers of Jesus will be known. Not only that they love one another, but that it is an imitation of the very love of Jesus Christ. Peter, one who always speaks up. He seems to skip over this important lesson on love, and, and he wants to get back to when Jesus said, I'm going, and you won't be able to come after me. Verse 36, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I am going. You can't follow me now. You will follow afterwards. Peter said to him, Lord, why can't I follow you? I'll lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. Oh, Peter wants to say, I'll follow you anywhere, I'll follow you to death. And Jesus reveals the heartbreaking truth that before daybreak, Peter will deny it. Please.